Hello and welcome to this video lecture on job analysis and job design. Good managers design and redesign jobs to appeal to employees' intrinsic motivation. However, designing a job must start with job analysis, which is at the center of almost all HR functions. So let's get started. In the process of workflow analysis, managers have to figure out what it takes to produce a good or a service. With this information, they design jobs and assign positions. For example, a new restaurant should probably focus on making and serving high quality food in a pleasant environment. That means that the restaurant will take uncooked raw materials and transform them into great food. This requires the use of some fairly expensive kitchen equipment and the hiring of a well-trained kitchen staff and wait staff. These people engage in activities designed to take raw materials that are transformed into finished goods, buy expensive equipment use, and served and cooked by human beings into something good to eat. The manager designs jobs like chef, assistant chef, food runners, wait staff, hostess, assistant managers, and janitorial crew. These jobs are then assigned to positions such as 10 wait staff, two hostesses, three assistant managers, etc. The process of creating jobs and assigning people to positions is based on job analysis, which is the study of what people actually do in their jobs. The activity box in the middle of this diagram is the focus of this lecture. Let's move on. Job analysis is the process of obtaining information about jobs to determine what the duties, tasks, or activities of the jobs are. Job analysis is sometimes called the cornerstone of HRM because the information collected serves many HRM functions. The first step is to identify various sources of data. Data are collected by job analysts who are trained professionals who are experienced in observation, interviewing, and recording. These analysts also obtain information directly from employees and supervisors about the job. The second step is the determination of the appropriate methods of collecting data. Both primary and secondary data collection methods are used. Secondary methods include an analysis of company records. Primary data collection efforts occur through interviews, questionnaires, diaries, and observations from both incumbents and their managers. The third step is the compilation of job data from the sources and via the methods chosen. The actual job data are then categorized according to job functions. Data serve as the raw materials of job analysis. Types of data include lists of tasks, written performance standards, documented responsibilities, as well as an assessment of knowledge, skills, and experience needed, plus documentation of job context, duties, and equipment needed. The fourth step is the synthesis of the data into the job description. The job description specifies the essential tasks, duties, and responsibilities of the job. The fifth step is the delineation of the job specification. This details the skill requirements, physical demands, knowledge requirements, and abilities needed for personnel to carry out the job description successfully. The last step is the appropriate use of the job description and specification in the various human resource functions like recruitment, selection, training and development, performance appraisal, and compensation management. For example, if there is no job description, it is very difficult to give a performance appraisal, to develop selection tests for that job, to identify training opportunities, etc., etc. Let's move on. To perform a job analysis is actually quite fun. It's not so much fun to study, so hang in there. It's incredibly useful stuff and it is essential to a sound organization. The first step is to figure out which jobs you want to study. Say, for the sake of example, it's a waiter or a waitress or generic food server. Then you have to determine which information you want to collect. Now, we all have an idea of what tasks, responsibilities, and skills are required of a food server 
even if we've never been one. Some of those tasks might be take customer orders, fill customer drinks, serve customer food. Some of the responsibilities might be treat customers in friendly manner, write and remember orders correctly, handle cash and credit transactions. Some of the skills that are required include pleasant demeanor, handling a fast-paced environment, basic memory skills, and basic math skills. The next step is to identify from whom you will get data about the job. The most common sources are the employees or incumbents and their supervisors. Let's move on. Some of the data that you will seek to acquire include the relative importance of the task, the responsibilities, and the skills, the amount of time spent on each task, and the criticality of error. Think about this last one for just a minute. It is more critical that the food server get the customer's order correct than if they fill and refill their drinks in a timely manner. For some incumbents, restaurants, and even some customers, it's a more critical error if they get the check total wrong than if they get the order wrong. So the job analyst gathers this information from interviews with incumbents and their managers. They administer questionnaires. They sometimes even observe the food server in the performance of their job. And they even rely on daily diaries and records provided by incumbents and their managers. The type of data collection undertaken is the focus of much of this chapter. And we'll focus later on various off-the-shelf questionnaires and some applications of the diary method. The next step is to evaluate the data collected. Many times, employees will inflate the importance of some of their tasks, responsibilities, and skill requirements. They'll even downplay the importance of some of these things. This is sometimes done just to jockey for a pay raise or to minimize the time spent on some unsavory duties or simply to reinforce a sense of self-importance. We mainly evaluate and verify this data with information from other employees who do the same job and with their managers. For example, suppose a food server consistently gives the incorrect change to patrons and in order to make this part of their job less important, they provide false information about the criticality of this error. Their inability to do basic math might have cost the restaurant some valuable customers who vowed never to come back. But the server wants to downplay that. The last step is to write the job analysis report. This is where the analyst actually details the information gathered and the restaurant can now decide how much to pay each job, what sorts of selection tests to give each job applicant, what type of training job incumbents will need to perform the job well, etc., etc. All HR functions start with job analysis. It's boring to study, but it's fun to do. Just ask someone you know if they'll spend a few minutes telling you what they actually do in their job. They'll usually light up with a bit of glee. Sometimes you can't shut them up. Anyway, let's move on. There are literally dozens of approaches to conducting a job analysis, or JA as it's abbreviated here. Many of the best are prepared by commercial companies who have developed high-level expertise in job analysis. The first three of these have separate, more comprehensive slides to follow, so we'll focus on the last three, which will be under the heading Other Methods here. These three are the Position Analysis Questionnaire, or PAQ, Functional Job Analysis, and the Critical Incidents Technique, the common metric questionnaire is one of these other methods, and this was designed to be a comprehensive analysis of every job ever invented. It is a questionnaire written in easy to understand language and asks everything from how important is the use of power tools to the performance of your job to how much time do you spend using a sewing machine? It started as a very, very lengthy paper and pencil questionnaire, and now, like most things, it's available online for a fee. Of course, many, many of the questions are just not appropriate for most jobs, so even though it is a one-size-fits-all instrument, after you whittle down your job a bit, the online version 
will only ask questions that are germane to your specific job. The Fleischmann Job Analysis System is a worker-focused instrument that asks about 52 different abilities needed to perform just about any job. These categories include manual dexterity, deductive reasoning, stamina, etc. The person completing the questionnaire, usually the job incumbent, uses a seven-point response scale to indicate the level required of each ability. For example, the job of a college professor would require moderate levels of stamina, except when dealing with students near the end of the semester, low levels of manual dexterity, and high levels of deductive reasoning. A welder would require different levels of these abilities. The ONET grew out of the DOT, or Dictionary of Occupational Titles, and has job analysis data and job analyses, two main results, job descriptions and job specifications for any job you could possibly think of. This should be the first stop for small businesses. It's free, well, it's supported by your tax dollars, and it's very professionally done. As a pre-made job description database, it cannot be beaten. Let's move on. Here we have the ONET website. There is a plethora of valuable information both for job analysts, business owners, and job seekers. Let's take a look at, say, the job of waiter. When we put that into the occupation keyword search box, we come up with a long list of occupation specific information. We have tasks, there are 25 different tasks. We have the technology skills, all three of them, instant messaging software like Blink, point of sale software, critical to the performance of a food server, and the work activities. Here are five of 17. Let's see all 17. Detailed work activities. The work context. These are arranged by percentage who responded with high scores. The job zone is in job zone two. There are five job zones. Job zone one has almost no preparation needed. Job zone two has some. Job zone five has extremely high levels of preparation that are needed. Skills. Knowledge, education, abilities, remember KSA, knowledge, skills, and abilities. This information here on the interest relates to the ONET interest profiler which is a result of Holland's vocational interest inventory. Two other important sections of ONET include that ONET interest profiler. Here you can take 60 very, very quick questions and it will give you scores on six basic different interests. Then it will find jobs that people with very similar interests have done, done well, and enjoyed. Let's, let's go back. Another thing is an important part of ONET for military veterans. Military veterans sometimes have a difficult time translating their military acquired skills into skills that are useful in the private sector. Here, let's just say we use the Army as the branch and all of them are listed. And let's say we put in 15W as the MOS. If you've been in the Army, you know your MOS. And what we have here is careers similar to Army MOS code 15W. These are the careers that are similar. You could click on them and find out what sorts of skills and knowledge and job outlook, etc. are required for that. Let's move on.
The Position Analysis Questionnaire, or PAQ, covers almost 200 different tasks and asks for responses using a five-point scale. It tries to determine the mix of different tasks that are required for performance of most, and this is important, most managerial jobs. It's also not appropriate for entry-level jobs because it requires, in part, a high level of reading skill. But the tasks are those that are most common to most managerial positions. These tasks include decision-making, problem-solving, resource allocation, etc. Let's move on. The FJA, or Functional Job Analysis, is another quantitative approach to job analysis that uses a lengthy list of various duties and functions. However, it is different from other inventories and questionnaires because it focuses on three broad worker functions, data, people, and things. For example, in regards to people, it might ask about coordinating and communicating tasks. With regard to things, it might ask about the use of tools and paperwork completion. In regards to data, it might ask about access to sales information and knowledge of raw materials prices. Let's move on. The critical incident method tries to document the tasks that are more important to job success. It relies sometimes on the diary method of information collection. In the best of all worlds, job incumbents and managers would document their examples of both very bad and very good job performance. Critical incidents. For example, if an incumbent puts out a fire that could have burned down the entire petrochemical plant, that is indeed worth noting by both the incumbent and the manager. On the other hand, if the employee is late to work one time and someone gets hurt because the staff are shorthanded, that's worth noting too. Thus, we could conclude just from those two critical incidents that having an eye for safety and being responsible and punctual are both two things that are important to work in a petrochemical refinery. Let's move on. After the job analysis report is written, an HR professional can write a job description and a job specification. We can think of the former as things we do on the job, and we can think of the latter as things we must bring to the job before we perform it. In reality, both job descriptions and job specifications are usually listed on one document most of the time. Now, a job description has at least four parts. First is the job title, like welder or pipe fitter or waiter or college professor. Then it has a section called the job identification, which lists the location where the job is performed, to whom the incumbent reports, and even a code for that job on ONET. Remember, ONET is the first place to start for small businesses with not-so-deep pockets. Then is the list of essential functions or duties. This is the list of things that the incumbent actually does as part of the job. These should only be the essential functions and not aspects of the job done by some people some of the time. These are things for which people get paid. So they play a huge role in the performance appraisal process later. Also, be careful with violating the Americans with Disabilities Act if you fail to provide a reasonable accommodation for someone with a disability who needs the accommodation to perform the essential duties. Lastly, we have the job specification. This is a list of KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to perform the job. Going back to the food server position, these might include an outgoing personality, basic math skills, cash handling experience, good memory, and multitasking abilities. Let's move on. Now that you've done job analyses for all of the jobs in your firm and figured, it, figured out what it is that your people actually do in these jobs, you need to spend some time on how it is that you design the jobs that they do. Job design involves things that are much different than job analysis. Job design involves the amount of supervision provided, the amount and type of feedback provided, the level of decision input allowed, etc. 
there are four points, four inputs to consider for job design. The first is the objectives of the organization. This must be considered. For example, if the company wants to become the low-cost leader in retail sales, it should focus on logistics, warehousing, and bargaining with wholesalers. If the company wants to use a market differentiation strategy, then it should focus on paying very talented employees a lot of money and spending even more on research and development, R&D, than their competitors. The second input is industrial engineering. Here, the firm should focus on the relationship between the various jobs. If it's an assembly line automobile manufacturer, it needs to decide if the product is moved down a conveyor belt from one person to another, or if a team of workers follows the product down the conveyor belt from place to place. Or it could decide where it is in the process that the wheels get bolted on versus the place where the windshield gets installed. These are all designed to maximize efficiency. The third input is ergonomic concerns that involve the design of equipment and the placement of tools. This is the domain of human factor engineers and their primary concern is a balance between safety and efficiency. The fourth input is employee contributions. These involve behavioral concerns like type and degree of human interaction and other factors contributing to employee performance and satisfaction. This is a huge area and we'll focus on some techniques for maximizing satisfaction and performance on the next two slides. Let's move on. The JCM or Job Characteristics Model is a model designed to allow managers to maximize positive job attitudes and behaviors and minimize negative ones. The JCM suggests that there are some core job characteristics on the left here that can lead to or sometimes cause one or more critical psychological states in the middle here, which then lead to favorable outcomes on the right here. The first set of core job characteristics that managers can vary for different incumbents in different jobs lead to the psychological state of meaningfulness. The characteristics of the job are first, skill variety, which is simply the type and number of skills that employees get to use every day. If they only do one thing on an assembly line, that can get very boring. If they get to do five or ten things, that can prove to be much more interesting for them. Good managers design jobs that allow for the different talents of the employees to be utilized within reason. Second is task identity. This characteristic is the degree to which a job requires the completion of a whole and identifiable piece of work. Good managers allow employees to follow a job from beginning to end within reason. The third job characteristic is task significance. This is the degree to which a job has an impact on the company or the lives of others. Knowing that the sloppy, gooey, smelly stuff that you're putting into syringes one after another on an assembly line is actually a cure for malaria and is saving 200,000 children's lives in Africa every year is pretty significant. For example, knowing that one's job saves lives provides meaningfulness, even though the job itself might be incredibly boring. The next job characteristic that managers can vary leads to responsibility. The characteristic is autonomy, which is the degree to which the manager allows the incumbent to decide the schedule and procedures for performing the job within reason. For example, having the autonomy and discretion to decide how one does the job also provides a tremendous sense of responsibility for making the right decisions. The third characteristic, which can be manipulated by managers, will enable knowledge of results of the job. That characteristic is feedback from the job, which is the provision of clear and unambiguous information from the job itself. This is not feedback from another human being like that coming from a manager. Some jobs have quality control mechanisms built in that alert the employee that the product is no good. Knowing that one's performance is acceptable or unacceptable at all times is a good thing. 
It should be easy to see that having on-the-job automatic feedback provides near instantaneous knowledge of how well one is doing. Think, for example, of a major league baseball pitcher. If the pitcher decides to throw a curveball with the bases loaded and the pitch hits the dirt and runs by the catcher and the winning run scores on that wild pitch, that is immediate knowledge of one's performance based upon feedback from the job itself. Each of these three critical psychological states of meaningfulness, responsibility, and knowledge of results allows managers to strive to enable subordinates to increase their internal motivation, their improved work performance, increase job satisfaction, and decrease absenteeism and turnover. Think about it for a minute. If one's job is meaningful and one is responsible for their own performance and they know immediately how well they are doing, that can be a very, very good thing. It can lead to higher levels of satisfaction, motivation, and performance, as well as lower levels of absenteeism and turnover intentions. In short, it makes jobs better. A good manager makes everyone's job better. Let's move on. Of course, there are other ways of motivating employees Technically, managers cannot motivate employees. They can only set up the work conditions where the employees are able to motivate themselves. Here are some other ways of designing jobs that will help employees with their motivation. Managers can provide job enrichment by making tasks more meaningful and the duties more satisfying. This is actually one of the key aspects of the job characteristics model. Of course, another thing a manager can do is to provide job enlargement, which is simply giving employees more things to do, that is, more duties. Doing the same thing every day can wear you down. In the best of all worlds, managers can use job rotation by cross-functional training. Teaching employees how to perform many different jobs can be useful when one employee is absent but it can, be, it can also help stave off boredom and increase self-worth. Additionally, managers can provide employee empowerment by giving them decision-making authority within reason. For example, what would the customer experience be like if the counterperson at a fast food restaurant needed to call the company's CEO to get permission to provide extra pickles on a hamburger? Not only would the customer not be satisfied, the employee would hate that job. These things have considerable overlap, overlap with aspects of the JCM, but they provide concrete actions that managers can undertake to enhance employees' jobs. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.